Good evening. During the formal dinner after a recent Princeton conference like this one, Professor Wenfang came up to me and asked, quite characteristically out of the blue, but Tony, what about regionalism? My stunned response was predictably, what about regionalism? Before this profound conversation could continue, we were interrupted by the customary speeches from the podium. So here, Professor Fong, about a year late, are some of my thoughts concerning regionalism during the Han period. Whenever we talk of regionalism or regional styles in any era or medium, the topic raises a group of interrelated questions, some of which are stubbornly difficult to answer. First, how does one go about classifying different regional styles? And on what criteria is the typology to be based? Second, under what circumstances do regional styles remain distinct? Or why might they blend or interact with other regional styles? Third, did contemporary textual sources acknowledge the regional styles that we can detect in the visual material? Or were such issues unimportant to early Chinese patrons? Finally, what geographic, political, sociocultural, or economic factors give rise to a particular regional style? I would like to investigate some of these problems by looking at the lacquer painting traditions of Han period China. When we begin to discuss regionalism in lacquer painting, we enter a territory with a very different material and economic constraints. Whereas the viability of, let's say, a local stone carving tradition is conditioned by the ready availability and ease of transport of carvable stone and the close proximity of wealthy patrons, successful lacquer work entails certain requirements of temperature and humidity to enable the many layered applications of lacquer fluid, as you can see here in this animation, to cure properly. The optimal curing conditions for the sap of the lacquer tree require a temperature between 25 and 30 degrees Celsius and a relative humidity between 75 and 85 percent. In modern times, climate naturally supplies these conditions year-round in a band of territory that stretches across the Yangtze River Valley and down into the Pearl River Delta. Received texts and extant objects demonstrate, however, that lacquer objects were produced well outside this area during the Han period, but probably only with the provision of artificial heat and humidity in what was called a yin shi, a shade room. There appear to have been lacquer workshops in most of the metropolitan areas of north, south, and central China during the Han, but the areas along the Yangtze from Chengdu down to the sea appear to have enjoyed a natural advantage in the quality of their products. Lacquer objects themselves are also far more portable than carved stone coffins and panels. We know from inscriptions on lacquer objects that many pieces made in the Qin capital of Shenyang ended up in tombs in Sichuan and Hubei. Pieces made in Chengdu during the Han have been excavated from tombs as far away as Changsha in present-day Hunan or even Pyongyang, North Korea. Based on stylistic similarities, the lacquers found in the Begram horde in Afghanistan were probably also made in Chengdu, then traded across the deserts and up through the passes of Central Asia. Thus, we might expect a greater degree of interregional penetration and mixing in lacquer painting styles than we would expect in stone carving styles. Furthermore, lacquer painting seems to have always been more open to influence from other media, including textiles, traditional painting, and as I once argued in another article, imported Roman silver plate. The history of lacquer styles in early China is still largely unwritten, partly due to a preservation bias that robs us of many examples that could fill in huge gaps in our understanding. The use of lacquer to waterproof and beautify wooden objects dates back to at least 7,000 years to the Neolithic in South China, as we can see here on one of the earliest specimens of lacquer ever discovered from the amazingly preserved site of Humudu in Zhejiang. Notice that the lacquer is already pigmented red suggesting that the date of invention of lacquer work is even earlier than this piece. During the Early and Middle Bronze Age, from around 2000 to 1045, lacquer was used as a final coating for carved wooden objects to provide gloss and contrast, but rarely were the painterly possibilities of lacquer explored at this time. The extant specimens of lacquer vessels from the spring and autumn period, 770 to 476 BC, demonstrate that lacquer painting was used at this time almost exclusively to simulate the decoration on contemporary bronze vessels. Here on this 6th century dough, we see some emulation of standard bronze decor, 
but a little painterly innovation in the form of these squiggles and the pattern up at the rim. By the early Warring States period, from around 450 to 350, lacquer painters had begun to explore some of the possibilities of the mostly bichromatic fluid medium and had begun to construct an engaging design system with borrowed inspiration from inlaid and cast bronze decor, textile patterns, and other painting traditions. By the late Warring States period, 4th to 3rd centuries BCE, when the size of our surviving sample becomes significantly larger, we can detect two different regional traditions in lacquer painting. That of Chu in the south, also incorporating the independent kingdom of Shu in the southwest, and that of Qin in the north. The two styles differed in the categories and shapes of objects that were decorated and in their painting style. Chu lacquers placed in tombs were more frequently related to funerary ritual and musical performances, whereas Qin lacquers found in tombs were most often pieces for daily use. Chu lacquer painting, as you can see on this 4th century BCE cup from Mashan, also shows a greater interest in representation and polychromy than do the Qin pieces. Like this one here from Shui Hu Di tomb number 7, displays more isolated geometric elements painted with a bichromatic palette. And here we see one of the few Shui Hu Di lacquers with a firmly dated mid third century BCE tomb. When the Qin conquered the kingdom of Shu in 316 and much of the ancestral lands of Chu in 278 BC, they brought about a brief unification of lacquer painting styles across a very broad area. Qin capital style basically supplanted the local styles in the conquered areas of Chu and Shu, but did absorb some local elements in the process, helping to enliven the staid Qin style. Distinct elements of the southern tradition occasionally poked through this unified facade, like pentimento images surfing through a surfacing through a restored painting. It took nearly a century for a successful synthesis of these diverse and persistent elements to be achieved. But one can see it quite clearly in the lacquers found in the three tombs at Mawang Dui, many of which were made in Chengdu. During the final decades of the Western Han, the great Mawang Dui synthesis of the old Warring States lacquer designs broke down once more into regional variants. the most prominent of which was the rich Rococo designs of Jiangsu and Anhui with their astonishingly dense scroll work with gold and silver mounts. The chaos of the Civil War after the death of Wang Monk basically sounded the death knell for the old decorative lacquer designs, which despite a few feeble attempts at antique revival were gone forever. The Eastern Han seems to have been a period of retrenchment and regrouping in lacquer decoration when painters turned away from the old Warring States-derived decorative designs and moved toward figure painting and narrative illustration. By the end of the first century CE, an outstanding new consensus style had been developed in Chengdu that would become the standard for lacquer painting into the Three Kingdoms and Jin period. And here you see one of the Eastern Jin pieces from Nanchang painted in the Chengdu style. When we again see lacquer painting of this quality in the Sui and Tang periods, this design system is also entirely gone. From this admittedly sketchy history of lacquer styles in early China, we see a pattern emerge, wherein regional development was followed by unification and synthesis in the early empire, followed by another regional diversification and utter collapse of the divine design system, and then a new synthesis originating in Chengdu. But can we trust this highly interpretive story? Were any of the lacquer styles we recognize as regional variants acknowledged as such during the Han? Did patrons care about such distinctions? We know from texts like the Yan Tie Lun, the Discourses on Salt and Iron, that, quote, moderately wealthy consumers preferred lacquer vessels from certain production areas like Ye Wang in Henan or Chengdu in Sichuan. But was this primarily due to the overall quality of the pieces made in these regions? or because they carried a particular style of painting preferred by patrons. The rhapsody on the capital of Shu, the Shu Du Fu, attributed to Yang Xiong, 
praises the style of lacquer decoration practiced in Chengdu during the late 1st century BCE with its combination of painted and incised effects. The author describes with remarkable faithfulness both the process of decoration and the most common motifs seen on these pieces. He does not, however, label such works as a definitive regional style in opposition to the works of other areas. To investigate this issue further, I want to look at a particular side branch of the lacquer family tree I outlined earlier, that of lacquer tableware with official patterns made in imperial workshops. The Western Han government operated luxury lacquer workshops both in the capital of Chang'an and at several locations in the provinces. The piece on the screen was made early in the year of 89 at the tribute workshop, Gong Gong, an official workshop apparently located in the Western Han capital of Chang'an. It is one of two identical platters found together in the Han period Lelong Cemetery in North Korea. As with many imperial use lacquers, it carries a detailed inscription, needle incised underneath the rim that describes the object in detail and lists the names of the artisans who produced it, along with the names of their supervisors. This particular piece was made under the forbanship of an artisan named Fu. We will give him the sobriquet Lacquerer Fu. The inventory accounting portion of the inscription, which describes the vessels, reads as follows. A food platter with ramy core and gilt bronze mounts with shu style painted designs, shu hua, and lacquered in black and red, fit for use by the emperor. The phrase that jumps out at us, at, the phrase that really jumps out at us is shu hua, shu style painting, highlighted here in red. What was shu style painting in the context of lacquered tableware? And how is it different than non shu style painting? For this explanation, I need to delve a little deeper into the evolution of imperial lacquer designs at the official workshops in Sichuan. The Han government operated at least two imperial lacquer workshops in the Sichuan Basin, one in Chengdu, the western workshop of Shu Commandery, and another in Zitong County in Guanghan Commandery, the Office of Workmen of Guanghan Commandery. The Western Workshop of Shu, the Shu Jun Shi Gong, appears to have been the stylistic leader among the imperial lacquer factories, and for centuries its name would be synonymous with quality and luxury. More than a century after its closure during the Eastern Han, private workshops would continue to brazenly inscribe their mediocre products with the name Western Workshop of Shu, hoping to borrow some of that cachet. The oldest surviving imperial use vessels from the Western Workshop are decorated in what I once called the classical Shu style, which was a refined and reserved variation on the early Western Han Ma Wang Dui synthesis. This style utilized a combination of incised and painted elements formalized from motifs seen on many of the Ma Wang Dui lacquers made in Chengdu. In all cases, the scroll work and figural elements were rendered in a thin or barely modulated line. This style was taken up by several other imperial lacquer factories, including those that operated in the capital namely the Tribute Workshop, the Gong Gong, the Workshop of the Right, the Yo Gong, the Workshop of the Supreme Forest, Shanglin, and the Imperial Workshop, Kao Gong. Late in the first century BCE, lacquer artisans at the Western Workshop of Shu began to consciously exaggerate certain features of the classical Shu style, giving rise to what I call the ornate Shu style. In this flashy and ostentatious style, which you can see here on this piece from 4 CE, the vessels were fitted with gilded and silvered mounts, and the red lacquer lines were drawn with thickly layered, unmodulated strokes. Eventually, the strokes would become so thickened that they would clog the design and render it almost unintelligible. The same trends can be seen in both lacquer platters and lacquer cups made at the Western Workshop of Shu. And here you see in the roundel what I call the three rat design. And you can see the what almost looks like beads and very thick lines of built up lacquer. While the Chengdu factory was developing this ornate shoe style with its raised voluptuous line and crowded compositions, Chang'an factories like the Tribute Workshop and the Imperial Workshop continued to produce their old thin line versions of the Imperial platter for lacquer imperial pattern for lacquer platters and cups. On the screen, you see fragments of another lacquer platter made at the tribute workshop. This one was made a few months 
earlier than the piece I just showed you, but its inscription does not say Shu Hua. It only calls, uses the phrase Hua, painted designs. So here we see a comparison. There is, of course, a pronounced difference in style between these two pieces. These two pieces made only a few months apart at the same workshop. To the lacquer artisans at the official workshops in Chang'an, Shu painting style, the Shu Hua you see on the left, only seems to have meant the voluptuous thick line. For in every other respect, the platter from 8 CE and the one from 9 CE are identical. The same lacquer or Fu who made the Shu style Wangmang era platter here, when he made an eared cup at the tribute workshop, demonstrated that he could paint in the thin line style typical of his factory. It's quite fascinating to see here an artisan like Lacquer or Fu who could work in two different regional styles, changing his painting mode based on orders from his imperial patrons. And here is a piece also made by Lacquer or Fu in the thin line style. Therefore, thanks to the detailed factory clerks and bureaucrats, we have a textual record that strongly supports the theory that Han artists and patrons did acknowledge that there were certain named regional styles, at least in decorative lacquer painting. The Shu figural style in lacquer painting developed during the Eastern Han is also quite distinctive, though we do not know whether this style was also called by the title Shu Hua. Numerous Han and early Three Kingdoms period lacquer, lacquers painted with genre or narrative scenes carry inscriptions on the reverse side indicating that they were made in Chengdu. These pieces form our core group for determining the characteristics of the Shu figural style in lacquer painting. By extension, because of similarities to these known pieces, we can declare with some confidence that the very famous painted basket of Lelong that you see on your screen was also made in Chengdu during the Eastern Han. The drapery on these figures is painted with broad swaths of contrasting colors with only minimal use of modulated black outlines, while the facial features vary from schematic to stunningly detailed. The pinnacle of this figure painting tradition is not seen on the painted basket, however, but on the lacquer platter from Juran's tomb, made in an official workshop soon after the Han period. On this smashed and mostly ruined tray, we have a marvelous portrayal of a court banquet hosted by the emperor, seated with two concubines in the tented pavilion to the upper left. Nearly every figure in this scene carries a painted caption. The ten figures seated along the extended dais across the top of the scene are invited guests, including the empress, a prince, and some other nobility. Casually traveling across this group, we see an almost theatrical range of passionate human emotions, from the outrage of the empress to the genteel conversation between the second couple to an apparent altercation between the third couple, to amorous kisses exchanged between the fourth couple. The dancers, musicians, and performers who take up the majority of the painted scene contribute a joyous riot of movement and spectacle. Though the entrance door at the lower left is quite a ham-handed attempt at providing architectural context, as we see down here, the pavilion itself is a masterful production as is the ingenious setting device of the windowed walled screen at the back of the hall. So we can compare the Chengdu painted basket from Juron's tomb with a similar composition from the north wall of the central chamber of tomb number two at Dahu Ting. The image is blurred by the passage of time and some poor photography, but once again we clearly have a scene of feasting and entertainment, with the curtained seating tent of the host placed at the upper left. All along the upper and lower registers, for a length of almost six meters, are arrayed two long seating platforms holding what appears to be pairs of male and female guests. The center of the scene consists of dancers, jugglers, and musicians, and other entertainers, just as in the Juron platter. The seated guests in the Dahu Ting scene are certainly more convincingly three-dimensional in their appearance than the Juron figures, as they sit amidst the billowing folds of their drapery which are often outlined in black and fanned out about them in an astonishing conquest of space. But while these beautifully rendered figures represent a cutting-edge second-century use of spatial effects, they really split, sit in splendid isolation, lacking an equally engaging sense of motion within their immediate surroundings or an emotional contact with their immediate neighbors. Each husband and wife in the Dahu Ting scene 
sits on their own billowing cloud of robes. There is no fighting, little talking, and certainly no kissing as we saw on the Juron platter. What is interesting to note here is that we see a remarkable congruence between the Sichuan style of stone carving and brick mold carving and the Chengdu style of lacquer figure painting. Both display a strong emphasis on exaggerated motion and strong emotions bordering on dramatic caricature. We should never forget the strong relationship between painting traditions and stone carving traditions, for it can be argued that all pictorial stone carving traditions in Han China are ultimately derived from drawing and painting traditions and were transmitted by means of drawing and pattern books. The stone medium might limit or alter certain painterly effects, and other workarounds or medium-specific effects might arise, but it seems clear to me, as a rule, painting leads while stone carving follows, and the two never lost touch with each other completely. So in the case of Lacquer Fu, working at the Tribute Workshop in Chang'an and occasionally emulating the famous regional styles of Shu lacquer painting, did not already upset our comfortable notions of male and female artisans working in only one specific regional style or material cultural tradition, isolated from other traditions of the larger world, I would like as a sort of epilogue to introduce the person of Bronze Caster Tang. In 1999, Archaeologists at the Institute of Archaeology of Shanxi Province performed a salvage excavation on a late Warring States tomb around 250 BC in the northern suburbs of Xi'an. The five meter deep tomb shaft, with the burial situated in a side room, was in many ways unremarkable. A few ceramic pots with offerings filled a small niche in the northern wall, but no cache of jades, gilded bronzes, or manuscripts on bamboo or silk were to be found in the tomb chamber. What makes this tomb remarkable is that it belonged to a craftsman, a metalsmith to be exact, and we know from a small bronze seal found in his coffin near his head that his name was probably Tsang. As such, it is one of the only tombs from the Warring States Qin or Han periods that can be confidently attributed to a practicing artisan. We know that Tsang was a bronze caster because many of his tools and the clay casting models that he used in his craft were placed within his wooden coffin surrounding him on all four sides. Twenty-five ceramic casting models were found in the coffin of bronze caster Tang. Carefully created through the techniques of carving and incision, these were the master models that could be used to create secondary ceramic molds for casting objects in bronze, or possibly gold. These models were probably indispensable to the livelihood of bronze caster Tang, for some of the pieces had been repaired after significant wear or damage. In the repertoire of Bronze Caster Tang, we find components of standard Warring States period Chinese material culture. There were models for casting axle end caps, yoke bar finials, axle tree components, and parasol spoke finials for carriages. Some of these carriage parts seem unusually small and were probably destined for scaled down tomb carriage models. We also find casting models for crossbow trigger mechanisms and legs for bronze tripods as you see here in this typical Qin example. There is even a model for making the complete foot of a typical goose-footed lamp. But within the same cache of models from the coffin of bronze caster Tang, we also find five models for making small decorative bronze plaques, objects belonging to the so-called Ordos tradition. It is thought that many of these small bronze plaques once adorned the belts of horse-riding nomads who lived in the area north and west of the Qin state during the second half of the first millennium BCE. One depicts an image known from dozens of other Ordos-style bronze plaques, the galloping steed whose rear quarters had been twisted unnaturally so that one of his hooves actually touches his mane. Most of the other plaques depict typical scenes of animal combat or paired rams and horses. One particularly captivating and unique example from Bronze Caster Tang's tomb depicts a mother clad in non-Chinese dress with her arms wrapped affectionately around a male child who is seated on the ground next to what looks like a felt soccer ball. It appears here that what we have is the case of an artisan who is comfortable working in two different regional traditions of bronze work. 
He could make typical Chinese products for his metropolitan clients, but could also make products sensitive to the needs and tastes of the pastoral nomads who lived in the Ordos area north and west of the Qin capital. Emma Bunker has been one of a small number of scholars who has argued that many of the intricate bronze productions of the 5th to 3rd centuries BCE found in the so-called northern zone were actually made by Chinese craftsmen, much in the same way that most of the masterpieces of Scythian art seem to have been made by Greek craftsmen living north and east of the Black Sea. The grave of bronze caster Tsang seems to provide the proverbial smoking gun. The two practicing artisans I have introduced, Lacquer of Fu and bronze caster Tsang, lived in the same area about 250 years apart. They helped to portray a much messier and therefore more human picture of regional styles in early China. Perhaps if they could speak, they could provide a better answer than I to Professor Fong's question, what about regionalism? Thank you for your attention.